Jackie Lukeman. And this is Uncle Baba Lukeman. And we are here for a quick treat special oh. in Lukeman Nation, in the cipher in Lukeman Nation, talking about the United Nations. Yes. Um, first of all, we'd like to thank you all for joining us. Thank you. Um, thank hit you. the subscribe, the like, mm -hmm. share this video, mm -hmm. yes. um, invite your friends, mm -hmm. um, even your enemies, um, and, and um, invite them to the most dangerous platform. Uh, the, the most dangerous show in social media. So when we start talking about this thing uh, uh, with the UN, I think it's very important that we start with a particular point in history. So let me share this video with you so you can understand the perspective that we're coming from uh, when we're talking about the United Nations. At the League of Nations, a grave disturbance. Today, Haile Selassie comes to plead for his lost empire. He wants them to make most of the League give up Ethiopia. The Geneva crowds are for him, but the exiled emperor will need his imperturbable dignity before the day is over. British Foreign Minister Eden, Soviet delegate Litvinov on the left, and French Premier Long and all the statesmen, instead of helping Haile Selassie, have decided to lift the sanctions against Italy. The introduction, the introduction of the of In the shadows of the press gallery, Italian newspaper men are ready for an outbreak against the emperor whose country their country has taken, waiting for his first words. <laughs> Trying to quell the disturbance, lights turned out. Again, lights out. The disturbers ejected, arrested, and he is able to make his appeal. <laughs> An ovation, yes, but he gets no help. The League lifts the sanctions against Italy. Applause, and that's all. Was the precursor or the forerunner mm -hmm. of what we now call the United Nations. It was an attempt of nations to um, basically um, come together after World War One, or what they call the, the Great War. Right. And so it was supposed to be like the United Nations today, an attempt by nations to have a body where nations can come together and diplomatically solve their problems before it reaches to um, uh, uh, conflict or, mm -hmm. or armed conflict. Um, we see that the League of Nations was doomed to fail from the start. Mm. Um, after the Great War, um, President Wilson, Woodrow Wilson, who um, was a great um, proponent of the League of Nations, um, who felt like um, this was a great idea. It also had the backing of the American public, who um, did not want to um, experience hmm. another war like World War One. And they was uh -huh. like, well, new countries could come together and um, the way that it was presented to them um, and, and avoid war by all costs, let's do that. Well, it was one, there was one major issue. The major issue though is that even though Woodrow Wilson was for it, he did not allow the United States to join. Oh, really? So the reason why the United States didn't join the League of Nations is because of a, a, a um, because of a um, provision in the Charter of the League of Nations, which stated that any attack on any member of the League of Nations, the United States and other countries were um, obliged to defend that country. Uh -huh. 
Oh, okay. um, this went against the isolation and this tone of the United States at the time. Mm -hmm. So Congress basically um, did not, um, Congress went against um, Woodrow Wilson's, um, um, uh, you know, uh, went against the United States entering mm -hmm. it. Now, this is kind of um, important if you think about the way that U.S. policy is being played out now. You had a Congress that at the time that did not want to see the United States um, involved internationally in that way mm -hmm. um you know um being um uh, uh you know having the united states being obliged to defend uh, uh, any country militarily uh -huh. now let's look at it the united states at that time even coming out of the great war was not a military power at all the united states was a was um, a, a very um uh, third-rate military power mm -hmm. um even after coming out of the great war they came out of the great war or world war one as they say in a lot better position where Germany um, was, the, you know, were basically destroyed, um, the League of Nations um, being um, uh, being the body that, um, uh, you know, that uh, facilitated the Versailles Treaty that mm -hmm. the Germans wind up rebelling against, which re which led to the rise of Hitler. Mm -hmm. Actually, the German um, uh, rebellion against the Versailles Treaty. So, so, so again, you know, um, the United States didn't. Um, they, they, the United States didn't allow, um, they didn't want to become part of the League of Nations because the United States was running roughshod. It wasn't all about isolationism. What it was is about Wilsonian diplomacy too. Oh. Um, Wilsonian diplomacy, which the, um, which the United States was running roughshod mm -hmm. in um, the Western Hemisphere. And it was also running roughshod in Europe after the great, and they didn't want to really be restrained um, by an uh, international body um, such as the League of Nations. So even though Wilson supported it, um, again, um, the United States was like they didn't want to be tethered by, um, um, you know, something that they, you know, by the same diplomacy that they, were, you know, or the same methods that they they were supporting. Um, mm -hmm. This this scene this scene the time when um, Haiti was invaded by um, the United States and you know the Marines and stuff, and that was supposed to be in the guise of preventing foreign um, uh, forces of coming into um, Haiti and taking over and stuff like that. So the United States basically had its own agenda. And they didn't want to be um, tied down, um, you know, by this stuff. So when when Haile Selassie goes to speak at the League of Nations at that time, that was 1930. Which was the only African nation that was a part of the League of Nations. The rest of Africa was colonized by the Europeans. Still, wow. Yeah, yeah. So, so I mean, so you, Ethiopia, which has never been colonized, mm -hmm. was the only African nation um, uh, that was a sovereign African nation. Let me put that. Mm -hmm. that was a member of the League of Nations. So so when Emperor Haile Selassie goes to the League of Nations to make this speech, why did he go there? What was going on? Well, Haile Selassie, first of all, um, this, you know, this was, um, Italy had invaded Ethiopia. Um, when Haile Selassie made that speech, Haile Selassie was in exile. Mm. So he wasn't, you know, he was, he was living in exile because Ethiopia was invaded by um, the fascists, mm -hmm. right? And um, so, you know, Haile Selassie was appealing to the League of Nations to basically, you know, punish Italy for, for you know, for invading its country. Actually, he was trying to make the League of Nations live up to what it was supposed to, supposed to be about, um, solving these conflicts um, uh, in a, you know, diplomatic manner. Well, because of racism um, uh, and the fact that um, Haile Selassie was disrespected, as you've seen in the video, he was disrespected not only by the journalists of Italy, but what they didn't mention in that video that he was also disrespected by um, representatives of, of Great Britain and others who felt like um, you know that Ethiopia um, that they, they they didn't come to to the defense of Ethiopia, and so um, they voted to um, um, to basically absolve Italy of its actions and to lift the sanctions. It was see, previous sanctions on on um, Italy. For its invasion of um, of uh, Ethiopia, and so the League of Nations, you know, they lifted all the sanctions and, and basically wow. just gave a pass and told. Um, but thank God, Ethiopian people wind up defeating Italy. Wow! So you know that's down the line. But yeah, that's that's how that went. And so the League of Nations had several failures. Um, one of the failures was not only its um, ineptitude or its weakness towards fascist um, um, uh, fascism. Uh, they were unable to stop Germany from um, taking over the Rhineland. They was unable to, to stop German aggression 
uh, so especially since the rise of the Nazi party and, the, and this German um, nationalism and militarism that was taking place under the Nazis, which um, used the Versailles Treaty um, as, as a basically, uh, a, you know, a bullying point, you know, mm -hmm. for the German people, um, you know, which caused um, its own, which basically fueled the nationalism of, of, of Germany. Uh, and it also caused um, Hitler and the Nazis to come into power. And um, and they were able, they were, the League of Nations was unable to stop um, Italian fascism. They were unable to do anything about fascism in Spain. And they were wow. also unable to do anything about the Japanese uh, um, expansion, militaris militaristic expansion in Asia when the Chinese, I mean, the um, Japanese annexed Korea and they went into Manchuria. Mm -hmm. And um, and so the expansion there and, um, you know, so um, the League of Nations just was looked at as an impotent organization. The fact that the United States wasn't part of it, also the fact that Italy, Germany, and um, uh, Japan all left. So, you know, so you had, you know, three of maybe like the world's major military powers and economic powers, uh, well, rising economic powers, all three fascists, or, you know, or imperialists mm -hmm. um, in, the, in the term of Japan, um, they all left the League of Nations. So, so you know, there was really the League of Nations was like, it, it, it existed to do what? It had, you know, mm -hmm. it couldn't enforce um, uh, any of its charters. It couldn't enforce, you know, so it was basically, um, you know, that, you know, you just, it just didn't have any authority, um, had no power. Um, it couldn't stop, um, these countries like Germany and them from taking over other countries. So it just, you know, it was a failure in, in all that respect. So then when we look at the origins of the, of the League of Nations in there and it's, and the inability of the body to do anything about fascism. And in the case of Ethiopia, um, the member nations at the time basically voted to let Italy have Ethiopia um, in support of the fascists and, and what you just said. So when, when the League of Nations becomes the United Nations, how, do we, how should we be looking at the, the efficacy of the United Nations in doing the same thing in, in responding to like apartheid, fascism. And, and we're getting at something here because the United States just stopped the United Nations from issuing a statement, from simply mm -hmm. issuing a statement mm -hmm. in regard to Israel's latest attacks of Palestine uh, in Gaza. Five times mm -hmm. the United States alone stopped the United Nations Security Council from issuing a statement condemning Israel's actions, mm -hmm. not doing anything. The United States stopped them from even issuing a statement. And the, the UN Security Council went along with it. Right. The United right. States voted no, and the Security Council was like, okay, well, you know, them's the rules. So, so when we're looking at the United Nations now, and we see the way they don't really respond mm -hmm. to a country that is right now being um, under siege from another country, how, how do we put this in context of the way the League of Nations, the United Nations began with the way the League of Nations responded to Ethiopia? Well, I think that the United Nations is a less democratic um institution than the league of nations mm. the league mm -hmm. of nations didn't have a security council so so i mean so you know here it is um you know um you had more of a democratic process with the league of nations where that you don't have with the united nations today the fact that a security council remains that can veto anything wow. didn't exist under the league of nations mm. so it's a less democratic institution than the league of nations um, um was um, and, and it caused um, uh, again the the points that you that you brought up. It's it's um, uh, causes the problems that you just mentioned. Uh, we talk about the United States um, having the type of veto power that it does in mm -hmm. reference to Israel, but also was doing that with South Africa during the apartheid regime. Right. So you know, so um, so we've seen the United States even block um, uh, resolutions from the United Nations when it came to what racism is or what Zionism is, right. or when the world body comes together and, and, and decides on an issue, um, um, as an organization, if it doesn't suit, um, uh, the United States interests or the interests of, of Great Britain or, or other so-called powerful rich countries, um, they, they just overturn that. So, you know, so right then and there, they have shown time and time again, 
how um, uh, that the United Nations is basically um, uh, uh, just exists as a symbolic um, um, gesture, mm -hmm. you know, that it really doesn't have any, um, even in the peacekeeping aspect, um, the armed wing, the peacekeepers, the armed wing of the United Nations basically um, are told that they can't engage an enemy. So they're there, but they're, you know, that, but, you know, we've seen in, in cases of uh, places like Rwanda and other places and Haiti and other places where they're there to keep the peace, um, how they would stand by and watch people get massacred. So, you know, and because they have this mandate that they can't uh, get involved uh, militarily to to protect the people that they're supposed to be there for, you know. Right. So so you know so again, you're talking about um, uh, an organization that that has shown itself to be impotent um, uh, in 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 matters of of um, um, protecting life and property of of, of people, um, you know, and 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 actually being the puppet. Um, um, you know, of powerful nations, uh, and especially yeah. like the security councils and stuff like that. So, um, so uh, we've seen time and time again that um, there has been attempts by other nations to try to change that. Mm -hmm. You know, um, you know, to to these permanent and, and think about that in the security council, permanent members of the security council. Right. You know, I mean, you know, that alone shows you how undemocratic it is. Right. You know. Right. So, so you still have. The power dynamics that is um, that that we see um, uh, it, it, the United Nations reflect the very power di dynamics that we see now. Powerful countries in charge, and mm -hmm. um, uh, and the lesser powerful countries or less powerful powerful countries, and and poorer countries mm -hmm. um, uh, being dictated to, or you know, being controlled by, or being not allowed. You know, and it's funny because you know, um, you know, we talk about uh, African nations. And why so many African nations joined the United Nations, and it was for that very same reason that the United Nations Charter, I think, um, Article seventy three, had um, one of the one in that article. It said that you know nations had a right to self determination. Right. They had a right to control their own institutions and outside of foreign influences. And so during the nineteen sixties, um, which they call the year of Africa, mm. when um, when a lot of African nations saw, was was going for independence, mm -hmm. this was like a natural progression for these newly independent African states to take the United Nations at its word and right. and realize that it would be some form of uh, it would be an organization that would have um, some form of um, protection mm -hmm. um, um, uh, and and uh, and and allow. Um, these newly um, formed um, independent states, you know, quote unquote, right? Yeah, right. you know, to to actually experience self determination um, without being, and also have a voice um, in 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 the, in the affairs of the world. You know, something that Africa for a long time has not had. Right. So you know, so you know, to be able to be heard on the world stage, um, not through the not through the voices of their colonialists. Right, occupied right but to have a voice themselves, themselves the right so the united nations was very attractive but we find out um you know as we all know through the history that you know um because of the the united states and uh, uh mainly the united states but others who uh, occupied this permanent um position on the security council that a lot of the um uh african voices were stifled so of the permanent members of the u.n security council how many of those permanent members are from African nations? Are African nations? Um, I think the last, and I, you know, um, real. I think Al, I think it was um, Algeria or mm -hmm. um, one of those nations that wind up having a seat on the secure, but not not. But you have one seat. You have permanent members. You have the United States. You mm -hmm. have Soviet uh, Russia. Mm -hmm. I think you have China. Mm -hmm. um, um, I don't know if it's Britain or France. I'm not sure, but it's easy to find out. Mm -hmm. But you have those, but then you also have rotating seats on the Security right. Council, which um, are occupied by other nations, you know. Um, but they don't have the vote that the United States and, right. and the members have. That's what I'm getting to. Right. Even if they have uh, a seat that is either rotating or permanent, they do not have the equal voting they don't, no. uh, power that the United States and other European nations have, which again goes to your point of the undemocratic nature uh, nature of the united nations I, I you know i never understood this also um when we talk about when y'all when we talk about the 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 
attitude of the United States government when it came to the League of Nations. Mm -hmm. um, um, compared to now, where um, I always didn't understand why wasn't the uh, United Nations, why wasn't it on U.S. soil? Why was the United Nations in neutral Switzerland or somewhere, That's you know, point. something like that? Mm -hmm. um, that also um, has the United States wield a lot of influence. Um, the fact that the United Nations is uh, building headquarters is uh, on U U.S. soil, and the fact that the United Nations—I uh, mean, the United States—contribute most mostly to its budget. Right. So, so you're not, and, and you know, as much as Trump and others have, ra have railed against that, mm -hmm. um, it has served the United States well because what happens is by the United States being the major funder um, country of the United Nations, it, it, it definitely gets its money worth. Exactly, you know? and and. You're right. The five permanent members of the United Nations Security Council are actually called the Big Five. And it is uh, the United States, the United Kingdom, Russia, France, and China. That's it. Everybody else gets to rotate, right? but they right. don't all get the same vote and influence the that vote. the United States does. And, and, and the only non-white nation is China. Is China. And you, how long you think that... Right. Uh, Right. And, and you see what the United States is doing with its with the way it is continually attacking China in this new court. Because see, oh, this is another dynamic with this relationship with the United States between the United States and China. China's a permanent member of the United UN Security Council. Right. So the United States is doing everything it can to delegitimize China, to lob all of these human rights abuses mm -hmm. against the country. That's why they're making such a big deal about this, because right. they want to delegitimize China, not just politically and on the world stage, but they want to delegitimize them at the United Nations. Exactly. Exactly. Yep. Because, I mean, just because somebody is a permanent member of the UN, it doesn't mean that they can't be voted out. Well, I mean, um, um, yeah, and, and the fact that um, it's not just China. Mm -hmm. I mean, we see the same play being with Russia, which is also a pretty exactly. member, so. but in, in the, but But when we talk about the way the United States is trying to use human right, these human rights abuses, uh, the allegations of human rights abuses against China, and, and well, I don't know what the process is to kick a member off of the, uh, mm -hmm. uh, of the big five, but I'm sure the United Nations has one. Um, if they violate, you know, part of the charter. Um, but the interesting thing is that the very same allegations of human rights abuses that the United States has been lobbying against mm -hmm. China and Russia and, you know, really just China and Russia, because they ain't saying nothing about the UK because the UK right. is in, and certainly not France, because, you know, they are the allies of the United States. Um, those allegations mm. are actually proven and proven all the time every day just about in this country against the United States. Now, this is the major thing, just to go back for a minute, because you mentioned something that was something about being allies. Mm. During the League of Nations, Ethiopia to this day mm -hmm. is the U.S.'s oldest ally. So, so, so Ethiopia was an ally to the United States even during the time when um, Haile Selassie uh, um, was in exile mm -hmm. and Ethiopia was under um, attack by um, um, uh, the Italians. It's, 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 also, um, it's also important to point out that that relationship um, uh, wasn't honored by the United States when the United wow. States um, forbid black soldiers, black Americans That's from right. going to Ethiopia to fight on the side of Ethiopian soldiers against the Italians. The United States sided with the fascist Italians mm -hmm. in order to prevent um, African Americans um, going over to Ethiopia. So, you know, so Ethiopia is, um, uh, is, is the United States oldest ally, which even now um, has just put a lot of sanctions on Ethiopia because of the situation in Tigray, right? But, um, but Ethiopia, even more than Egypt or the other ones, even more than Israel, Ethiopia has always has been the United States oldest ally. Wow. And uh, to back up your point or to expand your point about the United States forbidding uh, uh, black people uh, people, black Americans, from going to Ethiopia to fight for them against uh, Italy. The United States didn't stop white people from going to Italy, right, to exactly. fight for the fascists. Yeah, uh, so that that is one part. Uh, a fascinating history of the evolution, the foundations, and the evolutions of the United Nations and who the United Nations has served and who it has not, but. There's something that you mentioned a little bit ago that I want to go back to, and mm. you talked about racism. Mm. 
mm. um, and uh, how the United States is, and, and Israel are always uh, in disagreement about the definitions, how the United Nations defines racism and Zionism. To that point, there is uh, uh, evidence of this. We, we can show you this because in uh, the United Nations, there was a 2001 conference um, in which, and this was uh, uh, published in the Wall, St uh, I'm sorry, the New York Times, um, where the United States and Israel walked out of the United Nations meeting on racism mm -hmm. uh, in 2001. I remember that. The de yep, I remember it too. Yeah. The delegates from the United States and Israel literally got up and walked out of the United Nations uh, global meeting on racism and human rights abuses, denouncing uh, a condemnation of Israel in a proposed conference declaration and lamenting that a meeting intended to celebrate tolerance and diversity had, <laughs> they said, degenerated into a gathering driven by hate. Um, so what happened was they were defining and condemning racism and Zionism mm -hmm. because Zionism is a white supremacist ideology. Right, if right. we we talked about this on Black Power Media, and Theodore Herzl consulted Cecil Rhodes mm -hmm. about how to colonize, how, how to make Zionism uh, a successful uh, colonial venture. Mm -hmm. So. And, and let's not act as if these people don't know this history. Right, they right, know this history. Right. They don't want the history to be exposed for what it is. So the United States delegates were angry that Zionism was equated with racism and that Zionism uh, was condemned and, and the oppression of Palestinian people was condemned. Um, so they walked out. But it also shows you, again, the anti-democratic stance um, that the United Nations is really mm -hmm. how undemocratic it is because if it was really a democratic institution um, that that um, is, is you know that so many of, of the uh, uh, members like the United States claim it is then when uh, when the large body or majority members say that hey that we say that this is racism well democracy means that the majority rules right so it shows you how um, undemocratic um, that the United Nations is and always was and just not to belabor this point, but I want people to uh, make note of who made the statement about the United States' decision to walk out. It was Colin Powell. Colin Powell said, I have taken this decision with regret because of the importance of the international fight against racism and the contribution that the conference could have made to it. But following discussions today by our team in Durban and others who are working for a successful conference, I'm not convinced that will not be, I, I am convinced that will not be possible. Uh, so Colin Powell uh, was really not, objecting to the language on racism what he was objecting to was the language condemning israel yeah, for its was. treatment yeah. of palestinians it was. it was it was basically um uh the united states once again protecting israel mm -hmm. and israel's apartheid um, um um as opposed to um you know but then but then that was the same attitude the united states had towards south africa apartheid um under the reagan administration was this um this thing called constructive engagement it right. wasn't um, what brought down um, apartheid in South Africa. Um, the structural part of South Africa, um, apartheid in South Africa, was basically um, international pressure from the people, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. not not governments like the United States of Great Britain, which right. was appeasing the South African government. Mm -hmm. And so we seen that when apartheid did finally end, um, and we spoke about this on the show last week, we saw how um, the United States and Great Britain, in order to maintain that power dynamic ran down there and took the nuclear weapons uh, from South Africa that was supplied by Israel. And when we say supplied, the knowledge of building those nuclear weapons came from Israel. So, right. so, um, and, and the, the, um, the um, technology of the cruise missile. And I remember very well when South Africa um, first started um, building cruise missiles and how, when we used to have journalists at that time, <laughs> how the journalists traced that knowledge back to the Israeli military 
that um, shared the, that that knowledge with the South African government. Right. All of that stuff was basically buried and taken away once Black people got in control because That's the right. power dynamics have to be maintained. Um, one one other point I want to make too, um, when we talk about the United uh, African nations joining the United Nations, mm -hmm. uh, like seven, 72, I mean, 17, I believe, or 17 um, uh, African nations immediately joined um, the United Nations, um, maybe 72 right now, I'm mm -hmm. not sure. But it's, 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 it's really important to note that, um, that the United Nations have more presence on the continent of Africa than they do anywhere else in the world. Wow. So so let's let's look at that. Why and and so that that also shows how the United Nations as opposed to being the so-called humanitarian project of the 20th century oh. um, hmm. you know or the latter part of the 20th century um to you know this vision of this this uh, more civilized um world um uh, that the United Nations also serves as a conduit for um for um nation state private and corporate interests right um, uh you know so you have a lot of the united states um that um you know i mean you have a lot of united nations organizations mm -hmm. and stuff including peacekeepers mm -hmm. and and military apparatuses that's that's representative more on the on the african continent than anywhere else in the world and they're not just there as peacekeepers or or um and as we know you're going to be sharing some stories about mm -hmm. um you know the corruption through right. some of these organizations but but they also again as i stated they're conduits for corporate, private, and national interests of uh, mainly the West. Right, and just just a correction: fifty-four African uh, nations, okay. all fifty-four. All there right. are only fifty-four countries in right, Africa. Right, I, right. I get this wrong all the time yeah. too. I don't know why I think there are more countries in Africa than there are. I I, I don't know why. It just I I, I just I, I like us multiplied. I think. Yeah. Um. But yeah, fifty-four African nations. All African nations are members of the United Nations. Um, I dropped a link to that New York Times article in the uh, chat for you so you can re so you can reference it. Um, there is a quote in the article in which Powell said that uh, he was angry the U.S. delegation and the Israeli delegation delegation didn't like that they couldn't persuade the Arab delegates to remove criticism of Israel from the proposed conference document that talked about the racist practices of Zionism and described Israel's treatment of Palestinians as a new kind of apartheid. This was in 2001 that people were having this discussion about what was going on in mm -hmm. Palestine and that Israel was an apartheid state then. So that 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 is extremely important. So yeah, and, and what's interesting about that time period, two thousand one, mm. this was also the beginning of the U.S. policy of unilateralism. Oh yeah. So you know, so this was after nine eleven. Mm -hmm. This is when the United States started with this policy of unilateralism, which means that they didn't really care about the United Nations. I mean, this was mm -hmm. even publicly said by members of the Bush administration, where they said, "They look either with us or against us." Yep. So they basically themselves threw aside the mission and, and what the United Nations represented mm -hmm. um, by going on this unilateral mission um, to, um, you know, invading Iraq and right. all that stuff. And the the last person that was the last president to um, to um, uh, obey a UN um, uh, mandate was George Bush Sr., mm -hmm. who when um, the first Gulf War, when um, the general U.S. generals wanted to go into Baghdad, and George Bush Sr. said, no, the UN mandate is that we just liberate um, Kuwait. Right. And so he forbade General Schwarzkopf and Colin Powell at the time, who was also part of that war, to go into Baghdad to get Saddam Hussein. He said, we don't have the mandate from the UN for that. Mm -hmm. That was the last time that um, the United States, um, that was the last time that the United States cooperated, um, um, at least publicly with the United Nations mandate that that respected the u.n mandate um since after that when um when uh, 2001 you mentioned mm -hmm. then the united states been even today on this unilateralism where the united nations really don't mean anything right so since we're talking about africa and the united nations having such a presence in africa what's the relationship like well <laughs> let's take a look at what the relationship is like it is not a, a good relationship. It's not a beneficial one. 
According to this article, and this is an article from September 21st of last year. What is that? I don't don't think he means, but Uh oh boy, that would be bad if he, but it does does look a little suspect. But this is an article from uh, in the Africa report. Uh, that says the UN at 75 years, you, the United Nations was 75 years, uh, 75 years old last year, Africa and the strained relationship. So that's such a good catch. <laughs> so uh, African uh, nations, like you said, in 1960, when African nations began gaining independence, uh, they joined the UN, they became member states. But uh, what's it been like? UN peacekeeping in Africa has been a miserable failure. Now, why does the UN need to need to need to do anything about peacekeeping in Africa? Because of the thing we talk about all the time: U.S. and Western imperialism and the neo-colonial actions of the former colonizers mm-hmm. of those same African nations who are also members of the U.S., exactly. <laughs> which is such a messed up situation. So this article states that since the start, U.N. peacekeeping in Africa has been a miserable failure tied to the whims of a security council, which is less and less capable of performing its basic functions. Africa has not been served well by U.N. interventions. Think about this. The colonial powers lost their colonies but they found new ways to continue their yes. influence in their for, yes. in their former colonies. And the newly independent African states were like, no, we don't want this. We're going to fight you right. because we're independent. And these former colonizers who are members of the, U- of the United Nations are on one side, the newly independent African nations are on the other side and the UN peacekeeping forces are supposed to be stopping one member nation from invading right. and, and 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 committing imperialism and neo-colonialism. They're supposed to be the military buffer. They're supposed right. to be the military mm-hmm. buffer. And remember, the rule, the, the guidelines are the rules are if if you attack one member of the UN, then everybody has to defend. Well, I'm not sure if that's a part. I know it was part of the League of Nations. Okay, is I'm that not, is yeah, that a UN? I'm not sure it's part of the United Nations. Um, that they don't they don't roll like that. Right? Anymore. No, I mean, um, I think that you know, and and but 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 it's funny you mentioned that because now you have, um, uh, um, you know what what really came out of that, mm-hmm. um, uh, uh, when you when the League of Nations say yeah, every member state is militarily responsible, which mm-hmm. is why the United States was like, well, we ain't in that, mm-hmm. but. <laughs> The United Nations, um, I think, um, which doesn't have that, um, that led to these regional uh, um, uh, uh, military alliances like NATO and all this right, stuff. Right. So, so, so where they took it outside exactly. of the UN, the African Union, and all these places, mm-hmm. which felt like okay, we can't rely militarily on the United. And it's, and it's funny about the African Union, which is different than NATO, um, and even um, uh, even different than the old Warsaw Pact um, alliances. Mm. What's different about the um, uh, African Union alliances, folks, is that the African Union military alliances is heavily funded by the United Nations and United wow. Nations member states. So the United Nations member states control the budget, the military budget of the African Union, which is the reason why the African Union has been so ineffective in, um, in a lot mm. of the eternal squabbles of um of, of african politics for example we were just now talking about chad mm-hmm. right and the fact that the african union um basically um, turned its back on chad um turned its back um, um not even really getting involved uh, um in the the ethiopian to gray situation mm-hmm. um not getting involved in what's happening in mali it's france that's involved in all that stuff right not the states over in ethiopia but in chad and in mali you see all of this, fr- and now in Rwanda, where Macron went down there. Right. So you're seeing still this French, the, we, yeah, this we French. We might um, have had a little something to do with what happened in Rwanda. Right. So you see a lot of this French um, uh, 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 involvement still. Again, goes back to your point about new ways of of holding on to the colonial right. interests. But the African Union um, is not independent militarily. They are still controlled uh, economically. 
um, uh, and their policy. They they have they have to get permission from certain actors in the United Nations and stuff in order to even intervene in some of these countries. That's insane. So uh, so that that's <sighs> so you have a a a, a so called global governing body that's supposed to be keeping peace, right? But they know full well that the former colonists are still implementing neo-colonial policies and, and practices in the former colonies. And then they, they don't act like they're going to send some peacekeeping forces right, in right, to, right. To, you know, to mediate things. Well, how does that work out? Well, they, they point out all of the, well, well most of the, the places in uh, Africa, in African nations where UN peacekeeping forces went in and made things worse, like in the Congo, in Rwanda, mm -hmm. uh, um, in South Sudan. Yep. Uh, and it, this this is a really great ar uh, article. It goes into a, a lot of good detail. Um, they even point out that it, the United Nations uh, goal or their program of eradicating poverty on the continent of Af Africa, it isn't even close to being met. It's right. just insane. But but why? But but you know, and we, we're going to put that link in the chat. Yep. But also, you know, it goes back to what we were talking about earlier. Why hasn't the goal of of, of poverty uh, eradication been met by the United Nations? Because of so many of the special interests, so many of the corporate interests that um, um, that the United Nations is a conduit for. Mm -hmm. You know, the United Nations have, have um, really um, done nothing um, uh, with with um, uh, uh, with stopping the exploitation of uh, uh, and the, um, the, re re the extraction of African resources by private um, interests and private companies and stuff. Yep. So, I mean, and so, you know, so, uh, yes, of course, you're going to have, um, uh, they're going to, they're going to fall short of their goal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, another problem with the United Nations and the security forces and the peacekeeping forces. United Nations has a, the, the peacekeeping forces have a real serious um, sexual abuse problem. Problem. The Lukmans did not make this up. Nope. Um, the people over at Human Rights Watch, which we understand is a very questionable outlet, but I think this is even, this is the fact that, the fact that Human Rights Watch tends to have a right wing uh, uh, bent sometimes, um, I think even highlights how bad this problem is, mm. that even they pointed it out. So this article uh, is, like I said, from Human Rights Watch from January of last year, and they talk about how UN peacekeeping has a sexual abuse problem. And what did they start off? What what is the what is the case they highlight? Haiti, the sexual abuses of the United Nations in Haiti, just absolutely horrific. Um, but that's not the only place where uh, the United Nations had this problem. We heard about this issue uh, with the United Nations in the Congo. Yes, we yes. heard about this issue with the United Nations uh, in other uh, uh, African nations. So we're going to drop this link well, here. I mean, uh, one one uh, thing we talked about um, at one of our shows, but uh, one major issue was the sex for food. Oh yes, that's right. Yeah, that that just repulsive repulsive behavior then th these are supposed to be people who represent the the global body that is supposed to keep peace yes, yes among yes. the so yeah haiti is one of many countries where peacekeepers have raped women and girls or sexually exploited them like you said in exchange for food or support uh we've also th th had reports of this from somalia uh french and un peacekeepers in uh, the Central African Republic and UN troops in the Congo. Uh, just we'll drop this link in there for you too. So, so you do you see? I hope you see where we're going. Mm -hmm. I hope you see what we're getting at here. When um, when the United States uh, frequently cites, you know, their cooperation with the United Nations mm -hmm. and the United Nations this and and they're always talking about the United Nations as a force of good in the world. No, it's not. It, it really is not. Not not when it comes to our people. Right, right. right. Not from 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 Haile Selassie to what is going on in Haiti today. What is going on in, like you said, Mali, uh, Somalia, mm -hmm. uh, 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 the Tigray region. 
it's just the United Nations is worthless. They are, they are in, uh, here's the question. Are they unable to stop conflicts or are they unwilling? Well, I mean, the United States, I mean, the United Nations, I, I think that a lot of it, it I, I think the inability to stop it has to do with, again, the powerful nations, like for, you just named it. Um, let's take something as simple as condemning Israel. Mm. Now, the same United Nations, right, um, just the other day came out, I mean, plain as day, and said that what's happening in Ethiopia is a war crime. Mm -hmm. This is the language they use. Mm -hmm. When it came to what was happening in Gaza, they said that the Israeli actions in Gaza may contribute Maybe. to a war crime. Possibly. Right, right, I right. We have to investigate if it is even considered a war crime. But they were clear when it came to the Ethiopian army with the Tigray situation, stuff like that. So that's that's one example. And we we talked about, spoke about examples of how um, they can't even enforce a UN uh, mandate or resolution. How many resolutions that Israel has been in violation of, mm. yet the UN can't enforce it? Right. Um, you know, so, um, uh, but they're very good at enforcing um, the cap, you know, through Interpol and stuff mm -hmm. of capturing African leaders and stuff. Oh, and, yeah. You know, people who, you know, and and and, and taking them to the Hague and all the <laughs> Right. You know, right. but, but, um, but yeah, I, I think a, a lot of it is the inability um, to do those things because of, um, you know, st uh, uh, countries like the United States and others that wield so much um, power when it comes to the way that the United Nations operate. You know, even in our situation, let's let's take it closer home. When it comes to UN, um, uh, uh, um, when 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 the UN body has stated that yeah, the United States is a racist country, or police brutality in the United States um, uh, results in human rights abuse and stuff. Those all they all sound good, mm. you know. But 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 in the end, they're just words because I mean, in the end, what what happens? There's no censoring of the United States. There's no censoring of um, of of um of the way that the United States does things, you know. And so when I look back on um the League of Nations, mm -hmm. and I think about, and so this go out, this also goes back to our Pan Africanist um uh, uh, slant, and our Pan Africanist, which should be a Pan Africanist goal. Um, during the League of Nations, Germany, Italy. And Japan, United States mem member, didn't sign on to the right, League of Nations. Right. But Japan, Italy, and Germany, they all left. And they left because they seen that the League of Nations was not in their best interest. Hmm. The Nazis uh, um, um, wanted to um, uh, get back for the Versailles, the Treaty of Versailles. True. Japan wanted to be a world power. And they wanted to control their sphere of influence, which was in um, Asia, the Pacific um, uh, uh, have, uh Sphere of influence, um, Italy, um, which at that time boasted um, like the largest navy. I mean, you know, um, on paper, Italy had a pretty mighty um, army mm -hmm. um, until they started fighting. Um, you know, <laughs> but, uh, but 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 um, but again, they, you know, these were were sort of powerful militaries in their own right. So, but they all left, you know, and and you know, so I would love to see the day. When the political situations in these African countries get to the point where you would have a major walkout mm. of African nations from the United Nations, I would love to see that day come. And I think that they can only be facilitated through the implementation of Pan-Africanist um, uh, political thought, um, Pan-Africanist uh, Pan um, ideology, because that's the only way that um, uh, the United Nations already doesn't serve Africa. So so the fact that these African nations are even still in the body of the United Nations really is a slap in the face. It's, it's, a, it's a mockery to everything that this organization is supposed to be about. It's a mockery, mockery to the people who are um, still holding up this sham uh, 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 organization. And I would love to see um, the day when these African nations have the political um, um, guts and, and and the political guts meaning that someone there who is sincere, mm -hmm. um, a government African governments who are sincere, um, uh, in the vein of Thomas Sakar and in the vein of, of the Patrice Lumumba and others to say, Hey, look, you know, th this this is a sham, we're leaving this. Um, mm -hmm. we're going to follow the examples 
of, of um, the Germans and the Japanese and the Italians and the League of Nations. You know, wh why are we paying dues? Um, you know, why are we paying um, dues to an organization that, that, that has not served us? And um, so um, I, I always said, and, and, you know, that a lot of these leaders, um, they just want a chance to get to New York. <laughs> I mean, good grief. There are probably <laughs> easier ways to get right, to New right, York. Right. They, they just want to go to New and York. who the heck wants to go to New York now? <laughs> right. But anyway, I mean, if we, as we wrap this up, you know, what you just said is – well, that that was the vision of those people of the Thomas Sankaras of the of Kwame the Patrice Malumbas, yeah. Malumbas of the Kwame yes, Nkrumahs of the Muammar Gaddafi's. Yeah. This is why we know these ideas are effective because they they were so dangerous that the very institutions and bodies that we are calling to uh, uh, bringing to your attention have not served us. They're the ones who had those people wiped out. That's how you know an idea is not only dangerous, but it's effective. So this is why we have to keep fighting for what Thomas Sankara, what Patrice Lumumba, what Kwame uh, uh, Nkrumah and Kwame Ture and Muammar Gaddafi was fighting for a united Africa exactly. outside of and, uh, and, and away from the influence and uh, uh, the, the power of the United States and the yeah. European nations. No, it's gonna ha it's not gonna happen next week. It's not gonna happen next week, but if we keep fighting for it, it will happen one day. Our children, maybe our grandchildren will see it realized one day. And if that's not enough of a reason for us to keep fighting for a united Africa and a united African diaspora, then you're hopeless. Exactly. So again, um, as we end this, I just want to thank everybody. Yeah, we did sneak this in. We did. I want to shout out <laughs> Easy D and Red Socialist, and of course Ricky Ryan mm -hmm. and um, Lisa Catlett who yep. caught us. Uh, uh, let me see who else we have here. Um, Emily M, mm -hmm. Leslie, mm -hmm. and there was another one too. Zari, um, yep. uh, Al Ali Cologne. Uh -huh. um, there was another one, Mary Francis, mm -hmm. of course, and. Uh, Ziri, yeah, uh, Z Marzi. I hope I'm saying that right. <coughs> Excuse me. So, um, so all of you, um, if you know, we thank you for joining. Oh, Leah Bowers, of course, Leah. <coughs> thank you Excuse for the Forrest Hinton, Nancy Venter. <laughs> um, thank y'all for joining us. We did this because we're going out of town this weekend. Yes. And so, um, <coughs> this Excuse will me. be. You guys actually just caught. Um, Y'all was first to see what we're going to load That's up on right. 8 p.m. later on. Mm -hmm. So, um, so this will be um, in in place of our regular date, uh, date night <coughs> oh, um, uh, submission for Black Power Media. So we ask that you, um, you know, join, um, join, subscribe, mm -hmm. uh, all the housekeeping stuff. As y'all know, like this video, share this video. Hey, right, check us out on Patreon. Um, you know, so you know, join <coughs> us on. Um, Black, join this stream back on, on uh, this repeat stream mm -hmm. on Black Power Media later on. That's right. So, um, again, um, yeah, I guess that's it. Yeah, that's it. We'll see you guys next week. Peace. Be good to each other, as always. And check out our new theme song for the cypher. <coughs>